Hello everyone, my name is Dominik Majchrzak and I am a technical leader in Awaken Realms Digital. We have released our first game, Tainted Grail Conquest, three months ago and it was well received by players with 90% positive reviews on Steam. The game is a story-driven RPG with roguelite card combat. That's an interesting mix of genres that worked pretty well together. I will briefly show you what it's about because it will help you better understand the tools we have made. Combat is similar to typical deck building games like Slay the Spire and Monster Train. You play cards, they cost energy, you need to end your turn when you run out of energy, then enemies make their moves. There are many combat mechanics like blocks, armor, damage modifiers, etc. Between fights, you navigate through a 3D world that is procedurally generated for every run, and every run lasts around between 1 up to 2 hours. That's the roguelite part. On your path, you will meet many NPCs, locations, enemies, treasures, and of course, bosses. Each run starts in a village, which is the only thing preserved between runs. Here is a short summary of the game. The world is procedurally generated, with three distinct biomes, many buildings, enemies, treasures, bosses, and NPCs. It's a rogue light with some progress that is passively carried over runs. There are many quests and stories that last between runs. Combat is card-based, and hero receives new cards and passive skills with experience. Game is set in an original universe based on Arthurian legends. The universe is taken from the critically acclaimed board game of our company, Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. Here is the agenda of the presentation. We will start with short introduction, talking about the importance of tools and how to approach creating them. After that, I will show you tools that we used in development of Tainted Grail Conquest. I have divided tools to three categories, in-game tools, engine tools, and build tools. I will start with in-game tools, specifically runtime debug GUI, in-game console, bug reports, and analytics. Engine tools are next with story graphs, language localization, and asset cleaning. After engine tools, I will follow with build tools, build process automation, asset bundles, and automatic tests. Then I will briefly talk about importance of some third-party tools that you already know, like visual scripting and profilers. In the end, I will show you summary of tools usage in our project and conclusions that come with it. As a short introduction, let's define what tools are. I believe in a very broad tools definition that says that tools are pieces of software that help you create the game. So pretty much everything you use for game development is a tool from game engine to notepad. Tools we have define our possibilities. So for example, if you don't have a hammer, you will have a lot of trouble with nails. It works similar for car mechanics, construction workers, etc. Without tools, we wouldn't be able to do our jobs. Thankfully, we have really powerful tools nowadays. Using engines like Unity or Unreal Engine, we can develop a game in months instead of years. That's true even for 3D worlds with realistic graphics, experienced developers can do it in just a few months. But this presentation will be mostly about our custom in-house developed tools, because by creating more tools, we extend our possibilities. So how to approach creating tools? First of all, tool ideas should emerge from real world use cases. Analyze your daily work, but also the work of your coworkers and find out if there are repetitive tasks or common problems. Think if you can create tools to address these problems. Do this from time to time to adapt to the development process. It's much easier to create tools with real world problems in mind. Secondly, do research. Find out what tools are used in the industry. Consider if they can improve your project and if they can be easily adapted to your project if required. Look for solutions that are already known and can be easily migrated to your project to make sure you don't reinvent the wheel. Lastly, 
Remember that tools are used by people and nobody likes to use overly complicated and unintuitive tools. Especially when developing in-game tools, you need to take UX, UX under consideration. Let's move on to the first topic, in-game tools. As the name suggests, these tools are used inside the game itself, usually for debugging purposes. One of our favorite tools is Runtime Debug GUI. It's a tool that allows inspecting all objects in the game within a nice GUI working in builds. With it, we can see values of all fields and properties of the object. We can even invo invoke methods on those objects. It works for methods with no parameters or primitive types parameters, like integer, float, or string. <clears throat> this tool runs on a reflections system to retrieve fields, properties, and methods from object types. This is how it looks like. On the left, there is a hierarchy of objects with their names, and on the right, their details of given object. We can implement custom drawers for field types, just like we did with stats. So simple stat changes don't even require typing. We just mash the plus one or plus 10 button until we get the correct value. In the bottom, there are methods that can be invoked on the object. First, we implemented this tool as an editor-only tool because it was easier to make. But seeing its potential, we have rewritten it completely to be fully supported in runtime. It's available in all of our builds, but hidden under a secret developer code. Well, about that secret code. The hackers already cracked it and created cheat engine, but it's a single player game, so it doesn't matter. Thanks to it, we can download any build, load any save, open the debug GUI and have direct access to everything that happens under the hood. The debug GUI took us around two weeks of development. It has been used since then by all designers, QAs and programmers. So around 10 people used it for over a year. I'd estimate it saved at least three months of summarized development time that would be otherwise spent on more manual debugging. And it's not the end because we will use it in our upcoming projects. There are some tools that look promising at first glance, but don't work out as planned. One of such tools was our scripting console that allowed using Python in runtime. It is a very powerful tool because with code, you have access to the whole code base in runtime. We developed even a simple hints system to help with a API. The problem is only programmers learned how to use it. For designers and QAs, the debug GUI proved to be a much better suited tool. Programmers had very little use cases for this tool. And in the end, we preferred the GUI as well, leaving this tool to slowly die. We spent probably around two weeks on this system and used it maybe a few times. So this tool didn't bring profit, except for the lesson learned. I'm sure that with some further quality of life improvements to this system, it could eventually turn out to be useful, but we didn't pursue it. Why? Because we didn't feel that it was needed. Debug GUI was good enough for our needs. Let's move on to the next tool, the bug report system. Every modern game is bugged. Games have become so complex that it's impossible for programmers and QAs to find and fix them all. Also, some bugs are extremely hard to find because they are dependent on some other conditions. So unfortunately, players will find some bugs no matter how hard you try. And when it happens, if you care about your game, and I assume that you do, you want the player to report it so you can fix it in the next patch. Players can do it in a few ways, through stream forums, Discord server, or mail to developers. But a lot of players don't have that much time and interest in the game to go around Steam forums or Discord servers for such things. It's much easier and faster when the bug report option is inside the game itself. This is how it looks like in the game. As you can see, players can write a short summary, which is basically a title and full description with detailed information. They press send and that's it. The whole process takes a few seconds of course, plus the time spent on typing. 
Creating such a system from scratch would be very time consuming. But thankfully, there are some solutions on the market that help with that. We use the Unity User Reports package for that. I believe that Epic has a similar system too, but I'm not sure about that, so don't quote me on this one. By sending the report, there are some automatic steps that we perform to make the report even more valuable. We attach a screenshot of the game in the moment of report, and more importantly, we attach safe files and recent logs for further investigation. This is crucial for our QA team, because they spend a lot of time analyzing these reports to reproduce bugs. Additionally, we have connected the service with our Discord server, so every time there is a new report, a Discord message is sent on our bugs channel, so we can receive notifications immediately. Development of this tool took us only around two weeks thanks to Unity's solution. It quickly became the most used bug reporting tool for our players. We unfortunately received a lot of them and discovered plenty of bugs. It helped us fix some bugs way faster than it would be if not for this tool. I don't want to estimate the time saved because the profit of this tool is way beyond time. The main benefit is players' satisfaction and fun from the bug-free experience. That's completely incomparable to just two weeks of development. So to conclude, bug reports helped us create a better game. Tainted Grail Conquest contains nine classes, around 350 cards, 450 passive skills, 130 items and 45 enemies. The number of possible hero development comb combinations is huge. Balancing it in a traditional way would require many more designers than we had and some additional senior designers to overlook the process and make sure the experience is consistent across classes. That's impossible for an indecised team like us. And that's where the analytics show up. We track every played card, every fight result, every item dropped and much more. With that we are able to calculate for example, the win rate separately for each card, each item and each enemy. We can filter the data based on class played or difficulty level. Such data is priceless for games where balance is important. So, how to choose an analytic service? There are many available, but most of them have some limitations and if they don't, they are very expensive. We found that Game Analytics was the most suited solution for us and we are happy about the choice, but you should explore the topic yourself because every project has different requirements. To summarize this tool, the development took around three weeks, including research to find the best solution for us and many iterations and small additions to the system across time. Without analytics, we would have to cut the content at least by half to be able to keep it somehow balanced. Creating such a complicated card combat system without analytics would be impossible, or rather it would be unplayable. Analytics can be used for any kind of game to find out how players actually play your game. You might be surprised because players are very creative and can play in a way that you could have never predicted. To sum up, in-game tools they are mostly used for debugging by the developers or to gather feedback from players, either as bug reports or analytics. There are not many tools you can create in this category, but they are very important to every game and should appear in some form in every game. That was the last in-game tool, so we're gonna move to the next topic, engine tools. These tools are used inside the game engine, like Unity or Unreal. These tools are used the most in everyday work. Because of that, they especially need a good UX design to be as user-friendly as possible. Imagine a junior coming to your company that needs to learn all of your engine tools. Try to keep the learning curve as simple as possible for him so that he can focus on developing a game instead of learning the tools. Tainted Grail Conquest has around 100 story interactions and quests 
with many branching possibilities. Additionally, there are hundreds of cards, passives and items, all with names and descriptions. To put that in perspe perspective, we have around 80,000 words in our game. That's almost as much as Harry Potter Chamber of Secrets by J.K. Rowling or 1984 by George Orwell. Story Alone has 41,500 words, which is more than The Lion, The Witch and The Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. So that's what we're dealing with here. Tainted Grail is a game that contains an interactive book with many choices, conditions and variables. Some of the stories have very complex logic that is hard to portray without graphs. Here is a small sample of a graph that shows the most important parts of the system. Text node, choice node and condition node. These are the most important blocks, but we have around 100 of such blocks to cover all of our needs. We wanted this tool to be as complete as possible so that the story can have a real impact on the world and game progress. That's how a pretty average graph looks like. There are some graphs that are way more complicated, but they don't look that well on screenshots. So how did we approach creating this tool? The most important thing was cooperation with our story designer. He kept giving us a lot of feedback that we listened to. It's impossible to create a good story system without spending many hours creating stories in that system. We also were very focused on this tool. We wanted to create the best possible workflow because we like games with good stories and wanted it to be our strength. And last but not least, we had many iterations. With development, there were new requirements and more feedback from designers, so we responded with more and more improvements. From small things like move this checkbox to that line to make the node smaller, to big refactors like rewrite variable system to be able to use them out of the box in any text. I would estimate that we have spent around two months working on this, including all changes and fixes, but it was well worth it. We believe that we have a state-of-the-art story solution and we will use it in all of our games. No matter how much story it will have, there is no reason not to use this tool. Without a proper story system, it would be impossible to create such a complex branching story because the iteration time would be too much. It was one of these tools that defined the final state of the game and we are very proud of it. At some point in the development of a game, you need to think about localization and it's better to think about it before you start adding massive amounts of text. Most indie and mobile developers use a simple system for that, usually using Google Sheets to store the translations with columns like ID, English, German, French, etc. Then in the game, you use those IDs instead of text, and in runtime, you convert that to the correct localized text. IDs are usually made up by the designers. It works well when you have little text in the game, but this solution doesn't scale well with project size. Imagine five people are adding 20 texts per day each. They will spend a lot of time dealing with the ID system. And it opens a lot of space for mistakes, either with ID's uniqueness or just bad IDs that are hard to recognize. So it's both time consuming and requires effort to preserve uniqueness. We decided that it's, that it's unacceptable for a game with thousands of text entries and we want to automate the process. So we made a decision to support automatic ID creation that is hidden from users and works in every possible place in the project, including support for arrays, nested objects, complex hierarchies, etc. Thanks to this, the designer writes just the English text in the editor and the system automatically adds the translation entry 
to the localization system. Entries are still kept in CSV files, but everything happens inside the editor. The CSV files can be used with Google Sheets, but it needs to be done manually right now. We plan to support live Google Sheet editing in future. Additionally, we implemented a custom merge tool for localizations to avoid Git conflicts, because when two people add a new line to the translations, Git is gonna find a conflict because there are modifications in the same line in two different sources. For localizations, order of lines doesn't matter, so that conflict is just another time-consuming repetitive task. Instead, everyone has their local CSV file and the sync log button inside the editor. That button applies local changes onto the global CSV file automatically avoiding such conflicts. One of the problems that we encountered was the process of translating the game. We needed to export the CSV files to translators separately for every language and then import them back to the project. This part wasn't hard since the system was based on CSV files from the beginning. Later on, the translators started their work. But during the translation process, we had to make some changes in localized entries. To recognize which entries were changed, we needed to somehow mark localized texts that were changed. So we introduced states for entries. Every entry is marked dirty when it is edited and stops being dirty when it gets imported from translation. This process also happens completely without manual work. Thanks to it, we made a lot of changes later and designers could always export only modified entries to our translators. That's almost everything, but there is one more thing that needs to be addressed. We wanted the translations to be top quality, so did our translators. And to prov provide good translations for dialogue-based texts, you need to know the context. Meaning of a sentence can change depending on the context it's put on. Some translators need to know the context. To cover that issue, we created a story script exporter. This tool analyzes all story graphs in the game and outputs a huge CSV file with all possible dialogue variants that can happen in the game. This way, translators could check every possible scenario in which a given sentence could be placed. The development of this tool also had many iterations and took one or two months of development. It saved our designers at least the same amount of time and it saved them from many potential mistakes. Additionally, this tool is completely independent so we can use it in any future project. If you have worked on any bigger project, you probably know how much mess can be generated in the project and how many problems it creates later on. Actually, it takes only a few people working together to make a lot of mess. It's not good for the project. It slows it down and it gets harder to clean with time. To address this problem, we wrote a simple tool that creates a list of all unused assets based on dependencies from used ones. The thing is, that we had a lot of custom asset lo loading methods that were hard to track by the traditional cleaners. We had to extend the cleaner to apply to our needs. Now, I'd like to say that we succeeded and have never since had any mess in our projects. But that would be a lie. That tool didn't survive the trial of time. Why? because we, for some reason, didn't manage to nail it down perfectly and there were some false positives in the unused assets list. Let's say it was 1% of unused assets, but people started using it, removed some actually used assets and a few days later we discovered that there are some missing assets in the game. Bringing them back was not a problem 
that's what we have version control for. But the trust in this tool has been lost forever, so people have never used it again. That's a good short anecdote that shows how important it is to test everything properly and ensure safe, bugless workflow. You need to make sure there are no critical bugs, especially in tools that can cause much trouble when bugged. Let's quickly summarize the engine tools category. As I mentioned, engine tools are used the most and are most important for the rest of the team. You need to think about your teammates workflow when you design tools. Create a few examples with your tool to see how it works in action. Imagine spending many hours with that tool. What would be irritating? After some time, gather feedback from users. Maybe they struggle with something you can fix in like 10 minutes. That happens very often. Lastly, if the tool is no longer used for various reasons, remove it. It's much easier for people to navigate through project without plenty of dead tools lying around. The last category of tools we will cover are build tools. They are used at the end of the development pipeline together with the build process. In the contrast, they don't require good UX, but need to be technically perfect because you can't afford problems with building when you have deadlines and need to release a game. First build tool we will cover is the building process automation. When project grows in size, build times are getting longer and longer. In Tainted Grail Conquest, it takes around 25 minutes for a PC standalone platform that's neither short nor, nor long, but there are games that require many hours to build. Additionally, building for more, more platforms multiplies the required time. Imagine building for PC, Xbox One, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5. That's five different builds, so five times at least 25 minutes would be over two hours of build time for our game. Of course, you need a separate PC for builds because you can't have someone's PC locked for hours because of build process. And when you have a separate PC, you should go for an automation server, like Jenkins. You can access it remotely and it allows you to configure the build pipeline using many possible methods and plugins. So here are our current build process steps. First, Jenkins clears the working repository from any changes and checkouts given a branch from Git. Then it invokes Unity Editor build method, which is our custom static method that can be scripted to add steps like light baking, navigation baking, or any other in editor build step. We can additionally pass some arguments to that method to customize the build process. Additionally, we configured the Jenkins to automatically upload the build to Steam. We put it on a private Steam branch that we use for testing. The last step is committing our internal build cache to Git and pushing it. There are some things that we gather to our cache during build process, but I will not, not cover it in this presentation. It requires only a few clicks on Jenkins server to get the build on Steam after 25 minutes. And you can make those clicks remotely, for example, from your smartphone. It's highly configurable, will be easy to add multiple platform support and other build steps. Configuration and setup of Jenkins server took only one week of work. Plus, I have to mention that it requires a high-end PC for building efficiency. Since then, we have created around 600 builds over two years of development. That's around six weeks of building saved. Huge time saver and the must have for any project bigger than a few people. Next tool is our approach to asset bundles. And I will explain you how we reduced the average content patch size from three and a half gigabytes to 300 megabytes. Tainted Grail Conquest uses a system called Asset Bundles in Unity, with addressables on top of it. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Unity, 
It's a system that builds groups of assets into bundles that are put in the build and then loaded in the runtime. The system unloads them when they are not used, freeing the memory used. The game has a lot of content, so we needed good memory management and this tool gave us this possibility. The downside was it created really big packages that were completely changed every time there was a change inside. It means that after changing a single texture, the system had to rebuild the one and a half gigabytes package that contained it. And every package that was rebuilded had to be uploaded again in the patch. So after a while, every patch was over three gigabytes inside. It was not acceptable in the longer run, we had to find a solution to that. The most reasonable solution was to split the packages to smaller ones, so that by changing one asset, we rebuild only a few additional assets, instead of hundreds of them. We could do it by hand, but it would be a lot of manual work before every build. So instead, we wrote a tool that is embedded into the build pipeline. It analyzes all bundles and splits them into smaller groups. We wanted it to make as little changes in bundles as possible, so it keeps a cache which remembers the previous state of bundles. The next time it builds, it tries to make as little changes as possible using the cache. This tool took us two weeks of development, but it did what we wanted perfectly. It re reduced the average size of our patches to something between 0 and 300 megabytes. Of course, unless real new content is introduced. Let's move on to automatic tests. They are used a lot in traditional IT, like banking or web applications. You could ask if automatic tests are still tools? In a way, yes, because they are used to create a better product. In game dev though, automatic tests are not so common. Why? It's much harder to automate gameplay compared to business applications. First of all, in most games, there are many more input options for players to interact with the game. Additionally, games that run in real time are harder to automate because automatic tests are most effective when they run instantly. And lastly, game output is harder to evaluate because there are more variables that are subjective and need to be evaluated by people. But we tried to use test automation, and I will show you some use cases for it. Saves compatibility and performance tests. Creating patches for an existing game is a very delicate task, because you need to make sure to maintain safe compatibility from previous versions. Our QAs had to manually load different saves from older versions to check if they work properly. Because it was very repetitive, we saw a chance for automation there. We still need to manually gather saves from previous versions and put them to a special directory. The test launches the game and loads all the saves, one by one. If any fails, it outputs encountered exceptions. This tool needs to be manually launched by someone, which is a problem because it locks the computer for around 10 minutes until it finishes. It should be embedded in the build pipeline to be useful. It was used only a few times and saves compatibility is very rarely broken in our project. Because of all of that, QAs prefer their methods. That's why automatic tests should happen without any input from developers, because otherwise they might be forgotten. I believe the second case is more interesting. It's about automating performance tests. It's hard to track performance changes in the project, mostly because some changes are not recognized as performance changes and therefore not tested properly in this direction. Artists and designers often don't know how their work impacts performance because, because it's not their domain. When we notice big change in performance, we sometimes need to investigate Git commit's history to find what changed the performance. Doing that is very time consuming. What if every few commits there was an automated optimization check that notifies you if something changed? That's what we tried to do. We have a special PC 
that is built from our minimal requirements specs. We run this tool on that PC because some changes are, un are unnoticeable on high-end machines, but significant on low-end ones. We developed a custom command line script that controls the whole process. It pulls from Git, check, checks if there was a new commit and runs test if true. It can be also configured to run every X minutes. The test steps are as follows. Launch the game, wait a few seconds for editor to stabilize, measure performance, then we do two performance tests without specified groups of objects, like buildings and vegetation, to narrow down the suspects. To do it, we turn off given group, measure performance and restore it. After all, we aggregate results and send them on Discord so that everyone can take a look. It was running for many days, outputting lots of reports to our Discord server. The problem was, Unity Editor is not a stable performance testing environment, because there are background processes that can impact performance. Additionally, those few seconds we waited after launching the game were sometimes not enough to stabilize the performance. Because of this, we couldn't rely solely on this tool, and it was too uncertain to be useful in the long run. That's another example of tool that needs to be perfect to be useful at all. We might reiterate this tool later on. Both previous tools could work if we put more work into it. Because of their imperfections, they didn't pay off. We love tools, but sometimes you need to stop. You need to notice the moment where potential profit of the tool is smaller than cost of de developing a perfect solution. That's all about build tools. As I mentioned before, they need to be technically perfect to work, because build process is very sensitive and important. Tools that weren't perfect, like performance tests and safe tests, didn't survive. They are created by programmers for programmers to automate processes that need to happen every time you, every time you build the game. Okay, we showed you our most interesting tools that we have made and used, but let's not forget about tools that are widely available. Always look for available tools before implementing your own ones, just to be sure you're not reinventing the wheel. We will mention a few of them here, but there are many more. We're gonna skip the most obvious tools, like whole game engines, Unity, Unreal, Godot, serialization tools, Newtonsoft JSON, or 3D 2D software, because you know them already. For me, visual scripting has been one of the most important tools in the last years, because it revolutionized the game prototyping process. Unreal Engine is known from the Blueprint system, and Unity is catching up with their visual scripting solution. Visual scripting allows people from all roles to jump into prototyping and developing mechanics. It has a much easier learning curve compared to traditional programming languages. When we were start starting our new project, many mechanics were tried out by non-programmers, and that's great in the early stage of development, because there are plenty of mechanics to try and not, e not enough programmers to cover them quickly. I believe that rapid prototyping is the best way to jumpstart a new project with any interesting and creative ideas. Of course, later on, you're gonna have to replace those prototypes with more optimized and more future-proof solutions, but that's okay. We need to separate the creative process from the final implementation stage to make the most out of it. I believe that performance profiling tools in general are still undervalued and don't receive enough attention. I'm talking about tracking usage of the resources, mostly CPU time per frame, GC allocations, GPU time per frame, GPU VRAM usage, RAM usage, memory leaks. Most programmers are familiar with them, but I think other roles should have at least small understanding of the problem. Of course, not every game needs a heavy optimization approach. It depends on the type of the game you make. Most games face some kinds of optimization problems, 
very often close to the release date. If you haven't thought about optimization until this point, you're up for a lot of trouble. There are many different things impacting performance, one dependent on another. Bottleneck here, another bottleneck there. It takes time to go all the way down and solve all of those bottlenecks. CPU problems can usually be solved pretty quickly. GPU and RAM tend to be more problematic. Tracking performance from the beginning doesn't take much time if done properly, and it can save a lot of trouble later. It should be enough if you analyze profilers once in a month or after big changes. Notice what is expensive and how different costs change with development. Think if you should adapt your workflow to prevent optimization issues later, because it might become much harder later on. Build awareness, understanding of the problem. Thanks to that, you will be able to predict possible outcomes and react with the right solution at the right time. That might save you from fighting that dragon right before the release. And there are many dragons flying around then. That was the last tool in the presentation. So, the last thing. Summary and conclusions. While working on Tainted Grail, we have spent at least 20 to 30% of the programmer's time on tools. That's around a year of single programmer's work. In the presentation, we covered the biggest tools, but there were many smaller ones. A few percent of this time was spent on tools that didn't work out in the longer run. But that's a good ratio. Don't restrict yourself to create only the most obviously needed tools. If you weren't experimenting with tools, we wouldn't have created our debug GUI that was a perfect tool for our needs. The tools we made not only saved us more time than we invested, but more importantly, it let us create much better game. Tools gave us possibilities. We needed to create a game that we are proud of. Thank you everyone for your attention. We will start a Q&A session right after it ends, so don't be afraid to ask whatever you have in mind.